I like doing that because I live up in the north and I don't get to hear those southern accents all the time. I am the uh, dean of Baptist Bible Seminary and I'm the only southerner (laughs) on the faculty. And uh, we have some fun with that, actually. Uh, I need my computer projecting because I have a PowerPoint. There is a paper on your CD, but also a PowerPoint, I think. Both of them made it, and I'll be following a PowerPoint instead. Is that a problem with me? Probably you don't have a projector turned on. Is there a turn-on button? Right here. Well, you didn't have it turned on. It's always those simple things. It's because nobody was using it. You meant Tommy wasn't using it. Plugged into the right power, you know, like being in fellowship. Yes. Well, while uh, while that's uh, finishing, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, don't, well, let me let me tell you a story. Two thousand two, November. Uh, I'm I'm. It's going to be the first time that I'm going to leave the country after nine eleven, and I was a little bit apprehensive about that. I was just going to Canada, but I was still a little apprehensive. They were they were they were tightening up things, you know, and. You know, and I, I, I had my. Um, still got a problem? No, I'm just kind of fixing. It. I'm already pretty enough. Um, it took to, just like it was this morning. We've known that for years, Tommy. So. Eddie. We got a call for the real pro here. I got an up on your point. I don't know why. No, I don't know why. I'm just going to turn it off and turn it back on. It is a Windows box. But I would like to control it. Okay, that's a problem. You're just a control freak. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessive compulsive about my presentations. Function key for your for your screen. It's not finding fruits, if you will. No, why would it work this morning, but not now? To the rescue. Uh, here's, um, here's the next slide that will come up. Here's the next, next screen that will come up. Just click it at the bottom and you'll be set to go. Like here? Yes, sir. What about going back and forth? Will I click up here? P. P goes back. You tap that, it goes forward. You want to go back, you hit a P for previous. Okay, now they only see this. Right. right. Okay, yeah, very good. This is to let you know what's coming up next. Okay. And if you want to black the screen so they don't see it and so they look at you instead of there, we go B for black. So uh, it's always best for them to look at me. Okay, uh, where was I in my story? Canada. I was a little apprehensive. Uh, I had my birth certificate and, my, of course, my driver's license. and a, I, mean, I had a big stack of papers. I didn't know what they were going to do to me. And, of course, that was a tragic time for us, the start of the war on terror. Uh, and I get up to the border. I've got Rod Decker, one of my faculty members, with me. <laughs> get up to the border, uh, and the car in front of me, they're rifling his car, something fierce, uh, at the uh, booth there. And he looks Middle Eastern. 
And I'm wondering, I wonder if they're doing that because he looks Middle Eastern or they're doing that to everybody. Yeah, I'm just a little apprehensive about that. And then they finally, after a while, tell him to go over to the right. They're going to spend some more time with him. So I pull up, and I'm a little nervous. And the Canadian border guard says to me, where are you going? Well, I wanted to sound official, you know. So I said, I'm going to speak at the Evangelical Theological Society in Toronto. And he says, what are you speaking on? <laughs> so I said, the future of dispensationalism. <laughs> and so he says, is that a good thing? <laughs> I, I told him I think so. And then he said something to me that just knocked me over. He says, are you pre-trib? <laughs> I said, well, yes, I am. He says, well, how do you handle Noah and the ark? <laughs> you know, God took them through the tribulation. And then I talked to him. Well, he, they, he took Lot out before it hit. I mean, you can find all kinds of examples for things, you know. And so we had this little theme like forever conversation. I'm sure it was just a minute. And I'm looking over at my colleague, whose eyes are real big, and we're sitting there. And I'm beginning to think, the previous guy I couldn't get across because he looked like a terrorist. I'm not going to get across because I'm a dispensationalist. <laughs> and finally, after a little back and forth, the guy says, I'm pre-trib. <laughs> he was just having fun. <laughs> and he, he, he got a very boring job. And he just waved me through, didn't look at a single paper. Yeah, you know, I thought that was a very interesting thing. <laughs> Gives me a good story to tell every now and then. This afternoon I want to talk about the doxological focus of dispensationalism. You guys have sung the doxology, haven't you? Okay, it's a song, of, just a short little song of praise. Uh, doxological comes from the Greek word for glory. And I think, was it la yesterday, Elliot, you spoke on that? Here. And this is kind of maybe a little expansion. I'm going to use Gabeline that we talked about this morning. And I want to illustrate some of the ways that he expresses this. So I'm talking about the doxological focus of dispensationalism. I'm following Dr. Ryrie. And uh, the, three, well, the third point of the three that's usually expressed uh, talks about the glory of God as the integrating theme or the unifying theme, as Ryrie would say it, for the Bible. Now, I went to two seminaries in my education. First one, uh, most of the teachers says, now don't you be a dispensationalist, but then they taught it in class. In their minds, it was a caricature. What they had in their minds, what the definition of dispensationalism was a, a caricature. And the other one I went to was Dallas Seminary. Well, both those seminaries taught me in the classes I took I didn't have you, uh, Elliot, so sorry. <laughs> Taught me not to believe Ryrie's third point. And so I didn't believe it. I just paid it no mind. But then I did my dissertation on Gabeline. And I began to wonder. I read all the, the dispensationalists of the late 1800s and early 1900s, and I noticed they were talking about things in different categories than we normally talk about today. And they talked about the biblical purposes of God, plural. And they had a different way of looking at that. And then Gabeline himself, in 1905, wrote it. And then in 1930, late 1930s, he writes it again. He's consistent over his whole life in how he understands personal and corporate, that's important, hope. So I want us to look through this uh, using Gabeline as an example for us. The central interpretive motif for Arno Gabeline, that is for his written material and his preaching ministry, is prophetic hope centered in the personal second coming of Jesus Christ. 
When I defended my dissertation, uh, John Hanna, the historian at Dallas Seminary, was my third reader, and he said that this sounds like Gabeline demeaned the cross. He elevated the second coming to the detriment of the first coming and the death and resurrection. So it demeaned the gospel. That's the way he kind of took that. I, I responded, uh, Gabeline, remember what I said this morning, that he never preached on prophecy on the Lord's Day? So there's a difference between, okay, if you were to take all the writings that I've written, I hope you would not judge everything I believe by those writings. Because I've said an awful lot in sermons and things that have never been published. Um, he had a solid, Christ-centered, devotional center to his life. But he felt called to the prophetic ministry, and so 90% of what he wrote involved prophecy, prophetic truth, and those things. So I'm not being negative in any, any way here, and I don't think in his personal life Gabeline ever demeaned the cross. But he did believe God called him to emphasize certain things in the Bible. And prophetic hope centered on the personal second coming of Jesus is one of those. Now, he talked about four great subjects of Revelation. That's not the book of Revelation. That's in special Revelation, the Bible. There are four great subjects of that. What are they? Creation. I'm using a planet there to uh, represent creation. Of course, we know there's more than just planet Earth in the created order, but uh, that's, a, that's a better picture than something with the Hubble telescope. The nations, well, we've got a series of flags from you, Flag Day at the United Nations to represent the nations of the world. Of course, it's really ethnic peoples, not simply political boundaries, as the Bible would understand that. Israel, and I have the Western Wall, and the church. And of course, I have a church building, but we know that the church is not a place. The church is not a building. The church is what? People. Believers. And so Gabeline looked at the four great subjects of Revelation as these four things. And then he took hope and the glory of God and he worked through these four issues. I want to talk about those. He actually has five different Five different ways that he expresses prophetic hope. The first one is negative. I've got a picture of the slums somewhere in the world. I forget where that is. And he talks about the hopelessness of the present age. Now, you know where the other four come from. It's those four great subjects of Revelation. Added to this, I'll go ahead and put that up there. So these are the five starting points for his discussion of prophetic hope. And he's going to tie it up with the glory of God, at least implicitly. I'm going, to, I'm going to say it explicitly when we get there. But I want to first talk about this hopelessness uh, of the present age. Uh, I, I saw in uh, Charlie's presentation this morning, he had pessimism, optimism, pessimism, optimism. Remember that in his slides? Okay. We, as a group, are accused of being what? Pessimistic. Pessimistic. Uh, I prefer the word realistic. But we are pessimistic about man. Right? I mean, if anything, in the 20th century, we proved who we are. I mean, when you have, you read, 19, was it 1957, Lorraine Bettner comes out with his book, Millennium, and he's post-mill. And he has a chapter in there entitled, Things Are Getting Better and Better. We've just come through World War II and the Holocaust, and now we're in the Red Scare, and I'm in kindergarten, and they're training us to, in case an atom bomb hits, to hide under our desk. No, that was not a... We proved in the 20th century who we are, and we continue to prove it. And so it, uh, we have a right to be pessimistic, but I'm optimistic about God and his plan in the world. And I'm excited about God's plan in the world. Um, 
You know, I flew here from uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Anybody know where that is? Okay, we're uh, two hours west of New York City, two hours north of Philadelphia. Just so you know, we are the, the Scranton is the home of Joe Biden. <laughs> Just so you know. Well, we had we had a bunch of snow on the ground when I left. We, we flew Delta to Detroit. I flew in a bunch of snow on the ground there. Flew down here. Went to get the rent car. Walked outside, and worshipped the weather. <laughs> And I thought to myself, the kingdom of God may have come. (laughs) It has been a brutal winter for us. Been a brutal winter for us. But, you know, I don't really hold to inaugurated eschatology, Elliot. Okay, I don't. Uh, And neither did Gabeli, and I don't believe we're already in the kingdom. And it's certainly not in Scranton. You look outside. It's not there. Um, It's one of the close to bankruptcy and one of the most corrupt cities in the United States. Um, they, they need a whole. They need a, a boatload of gospel, but they won't receive it. Down here, I'm sure you guys have some problems, but I, I feel more at home in the culture here uh, than I do back there. But that's where God has sent me, and I'm glad that He has. You read the newspapers. Do you think we're already in the kingdom? Look on the world scene. Are we already in the kingdom? Do we have any justification for believing that this, this world is the present evil age? Galatians chapter 1, Paul says in verse 3, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. That's how Paul labels the present age. The present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory, doxology, glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now there it points to the first coming as a solution to help us get out of the present evil age. But let me take you to a couple of other passages. If you have Bibles, do you bring Bibles to this thing? Okay. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Excuse me, chapter 1. Verse 5. Uh, well, let's, let's pick up verse 4. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. And the Thessalonians are going through a lot. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be kind of worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. He's talking about there's going to be a great reversal one day. When is that? This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. That's not a seeker-sensitive verse. (laughs) He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony. To you, And then he goes on to develop that a little bit in a couple more verses. He takes the Thessalonians, believers, true, not the whole world, but believers. And what's the first thing he says after the initial greetings? Because of their suffering, take hope, Jesus is coming. Now go over to 1 Peter. I think sometimes we don't pay enough attention to the second coming passages. In 1 Peter. 1 Peter is a book about what? Suffering. And so what does he say to suffering Christians? Verse 3 of chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you 
who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. He's pointing ahead, not backwards. He's not talking about the cross. He's talking about the second coming. Then he goes on to say, verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. When you come down to verse 13, therefore, prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, set your hope partially on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Did I read that right? No. Set your hope, what's the word? Fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. See, we get a lot of criticism. Uh, Say, we're we're just so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good, or we're so future minded, we're no present good. Uh, They they think we have a, a brain warp about the second coming. Well, you know what? If we do, so did. Paul and Peter. Peter tells them a you know, few introductory things, and then he says, in light of your suffering, take heart because Jesus is coming, and you focus on that. This is strong language. And so we have the hopelessness of the present world, and the Bible points us and teaches us that, but also points us to the hope. We have the hope, and we live in the shadow of two things. We live in the shadow of the cross. We live in the shadow of the second coming. Uh, In between is not the inaugurated kingdom. But we live with those two things as the anchors of our hope. And we need to understand that and, uh, and embrace it fully. So we have five ways that Gabeline talked about hope. He talked about it in reference to the hopelessness of the present age. But then he talked about how through time, through history, God deals with the hope for the four great subjects of Revelation, the creation, the nations, Israel, and the church. Now, let me say a little more about the hopelessness of the present age. In the 1930s, Gabeline writes a series of books. Now, what's happening in the 1930s? Was it the Roaring Thirties? No, it was the Roaring Twenties. It was depression, there was lead up to World War II, and all the things that were going on, all the intrigue that was happening. In 1933, he writes Conflict of the Ages, probably his most controversial book. Uh, That's a book uh, that sounds to some people like a conspiracy theory nuts book. But he he was dealing with what he thought were elements in the, in the culture that were going to lead to the tribulation period ultimately. We might say he was dealing with the setup for the end time days. That's how in his mind he was thinking of that. And uh, he talked about the mystery of lawlessness. And the Bible does tell us that lawlessness is working throughout history, all of history. And it's going to culminate in the tribulation period. Uh, when it will be dealt with when Jesus comes back at the end of that. So he writes that in 1933. Uh, In 1934, he he writes World Prospects, whereas the mystery of lawlessness throughout the age leading to the tribulation in the first book, in the 1934 book, he's dealing with primarily the tribulation period and dealing with how he would understand those world prospects. And, of course, they're not good from the world's point of view. And so he addresses that particular point. Then in 1935, he writes a book, I love this title, Hopeless, Yet There is Hope. See, the hopelessness of the present age, but there's hope, and there's hope for those four major subjects of Revelation, uh, as he would say that. And he argues, like I just did, 20th century, now he's living, when does he write this? 1935, and he already pronounces the 20th century is a colossal failure. So 65 years is not going to recover. And he talks about war, financial collapse, which he interpreted as due to evil. And then he talks about communism. 
He was staunch in his affirmations. Uh, And then he writes uh, in 1937, as it was, so shall it be. And he talks, he does a comparison. Noah's time to our time. And he develops those theme. Now, you've probably preached some sermons like that. Well, he writes a whole book kind of outlining that and helping people to understand. Really, he's trying to alert people what to look for in their own hearts and minds. Uh, and then he writes The Hope of the Ages, kind of the culmination, 1938, the present absence of hope, but hope is coming. It's like he, he just threw out these four negative books with little glimpses of hope, and then he, he finishes off with a trophy book, says, hey, it's going to get better. And he encourages us, the hope of the ages, which I probably believe is out of all his books, is the most important book that Gabeline wrote. You won't find too much of his typology in that book. You'll find his typology in his commentaries of historical narratives. Uh, But this is a book that's worth reading, in my opinion. I told you about uh, his uh, announcement of Hitler and what Hitler was doing long before the world understood all of those things. Now, Gabeline asked a question in light of all those books and things like that. He said, why the hopelessness? Hopeless, yet there's hope. The hope of the ages. Why is there hopelessness? We, we know the answers, but we need to express them in certain ways. Uh, the simple answer is sin. Sin has distanced us from God, and but also sin is, has led to certain paths of action on the part of the human race. And he wants to address two of these. First is the persecution of the Jews. We have a long history of that. I had a homeschooling group in Binghamton, Binghamton New York, asked me to come talk to uh, about 40 high schoolers. Uh, to give a a uh, two-hour presentation on the history of modern Israel. And and they asked me to start with all the pogroms, all the persecution in Russia and other places. And you know, when I started going through all that, I I felt really bad. It depressed me to look at that. We know in the Bible there's persecution of Jews. Revelation 12, in the tribulation period, Satan, he hates Christians. First Peter 5, 8, right? He's walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And in the tribulation period, he shows he hates Jews too. And he goes after them. In 1982, I, I had the privilege, I was an uh, aerospace avionics engineer in my previous life. Uh, and I got a free trip to Israel out of that. Because I worked for General Dynamics in Fort Worth, helping to pay for uh, Dallas Seminary. I let you guys charge an awful lot, so I had to get a job. Um, <laughs> and uh, I got chosen for the is- is- Israeli project. And we were sitting in an engineering room, and there were about 25 engineers, and the project leader comes in. All these guys are from different groups, and he says, by contract, we have to send four people to Israel. Three hardware guys, one software guy. Any software guys in here? I raised my hand. I was the only guy. You're going to Israel. I, you know, I was excited. But it's amazing all the other guys who didn't want to go to Israel. I wanted to go. While I was there, I, I spent a month not doing the Holy Land tours, but uh, working six days a week with Israeli military. And that in the summer of, 90, uh, of 1982 was in the middle of the First Lebanon War. Remember when they had Beirut surrounded, those are old enough? And they were about to push the PLO into the sea? And a lot of us were saying, yeah. And then the U.S. stopped them. The U.S. government stepped in and stopped them. I know we need to have sympathy for people who aren't uh, Israelis. But I remember the soldiers just complaining about the United States government and all that pressure we put on them to stop. 
they had cleaned up all of Lebanon except for Beirut, and they were going to finish that off and end that curse and all the Katusha rocket launchers coming into northern Israel and all that stuff, and we stopped them. I went up to one of them and asked him, why do you guys care what we think? Why don't you just do what you think is right, regardless of what we think? And I'll never forget, he looked at me, kind of a forlorn look, and he says, you are the only friends that we have. I'm not sure that's true anymore. It might be better to say that dispensational evangelical Christians are the only friends they have. But the persecution of the Jews continues. Uh, I'm working on a paper now. I'm going to give it in chapel next week at our seminary. Has the uh, formation of the modern state of Israel solved the Jewish question? Theodor Herzl and his attempt, you know, the, the modern Zionist movement, if we would just get a homeland, it would stop all of this persecution. How did that work out? It hasn't worked out. And anti-Semitism has just shifted. It's still everywhere, but shifted to Israel. And so we have the persecution of the Jews. And persecution, some reading I've been doing and some experiences I've had, some of the persecution comes from Jews themselves. Maybe Gabe Lyons right, that there were, he thought in the end time days there would be secular Jews rise up to, to attack religious Jews. And there's certainly those in the United States among the Jews who do not support Israel. I was up at Binghamton University. I was asked to speak for uh, Thank God for Israel Day back in the spring of last year. There was a Jewish lady, speaker from, uh, she was a community organizer kind of person from Chicago. Uh, she, She was Jewish and she was very conservative and very pro-Israel and very anti-Muslim. And, uh, you know, I'm worried. I I was told Friends of Israel was there with a consultant to make sure that I didn't say anything that got me in trouble uh, because of the Muslim students who were at the university. This is about 20,000 student university. Uh, And I sat there trying to mull over, how am I going to say this? I want to be careful and be fair. Uh, And uh, this lady gets up, her name's Peggy Shapiro, a very Jewish name. And she blasted all the Muslims in history. (laughs) And I'm thinking, I have nothing to worry about. (laughs) So I I just gave my testimony uh, about my feelings about Israel. I gave the theological reasons. I explained what born-again Christianity was. I said, that's the perspective I'm coming from. Well, one of the seniors, students there, who's Jewish, There are about 250 people there, I guess. He wrote a blog entry on some blog that he does, some Jewish blog. And the title of his presentation was, Do Christians Love Israel More Than I Do? And his article was, you know, we've we've fight issues like, you know, the thing that I'm worried about or have been worried about is, why why do the women have to segregate at the Western Wall. You have the men's section, you have the ladies' section. If you've been there, you know that. So, and that's so sexist. So, and we've been fighting those kind of things. And here comes somebody, he, and he speaks, and he's not worried about those things. He just loves Israel. And he longed for, the way he put it, he may have been calling me childish, I don't know, but he longed for being six years old again and not having complications of life clouding his judgment if he could just love Israel again. And that's a Jew talking. The second uh, reason for hopelessness that Gabeline gave was the increasing moral and religious declension in Christendom. The first one is Jewish. The second one involves Christendom. And, of course, he was looking at that from the Roaring Twenties, the profligacy of that, the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, the fundamentalist modernist controversy, and the abandonment of the faith. And I wonder what Arnold Gable and I would say today. We've gone a whole lot farther 
than they were in the 1920s and 30s. But he looked at this and said, the hopelessness is produced by those two things. And both those things ignore God's word, God's way, God's design. Now, uh, I'm going to try to make this uh, part work. Now, that's the hopelessness. Now, and, and he leaves it there, and then he says, but the hope. And I want to walk through the hope a little bit, and I'm going to try to handle this Mac, Macintosh thing, the contraption, uh, the best that I can. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, this is, I got a chart here. This is the focus on individual redemption in covenant theology. I show this to my students. You remember this, Bruce? Okay. Uh, the covenant of works in the garden with Adam, then the fall happens, and after that, the covenant of grace in covenant theology focuses on individual redemption through election. Notice the focus is on individual redemption. They really don't focus on corporate things. Now, there's a lot of stuff in the New Testament about individual redemption in the church. That's emphasized. But in the Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament, yeah, it talks about individual redemption, but it says an awful lot, maybe more, about community and national promises to Israel. Well, they're not reading those passages in a grammatical historical sense. They're reading them with the glasses on of the covenant of grace. And the covenant of grace is about individual redemption. That doesn't fit the passages, all the passages in the Old Testament. So that's the basis for why they read the new back into the old. Now, I want you to know, see the boring pastel colors I used for this chart for covenant theology? Do you see that? Compare that to the colorful, exciting dispensational chart. Okay. A little subliminal teaching there. You know, we got an awful lot going for us, and we need to parade it. We are, after all, right. We're talking about truth. Now, this chart is my chart, so don't blame anybody else. A few disclaimers. That is not the eye of the Illuminati. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. The triangle, there's no... There's no New Age mysticism there, and it doesn't even fit the Trinity. It's not so much like it's just a device, visual device, to help me communicate a few things. Now, inside the triangle are individualistic things. God's plan for individual angels. God's plan for the salvation of individual men. I made that big and colorful because we're sometimes accused of, we're just into national Israel. We don't care about individual men. Well, that's never been true. We believe in the salvation of individual men. In fact, we're accused of putting the church down. See, the church is just a mere parenthesis. The church isn't a mere parenthesis. God knew from before the foundation of the world about the church. It's not a surprise to him. It's not that, you know, oops, they rejected Jesus. He wasn't expecting that. And so he was forced to go do something new. That's not what we teach. That's not what we believe. But that's what they say we teach and believe. We're not attacking the sovereignty of God at all. We do believe in individual salvation of men. We do believe, have a high view of the church. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's God's plan for the lost. God has a plan for them too. So everything inside the triangle is individualistic. Everything outside is more programmatic or institutional, sometimes I will say. Now, let's kind of look at that as we walk through this. You see the four subjects of revelation from Gabeline there? World or creation, nations, Israel, church. Now, there is portrayed in the outside of the triangle there an inverted order because the beginning point of the final fulfillment of redemption for each one of those begins in reverse order from when it comes up in history. Creation of the world is obviously first, that's ex nihilo. The other creations are not ex nihilo. It just creates the nations from within the peoples. Then he creates Israel from, the, from out of the nations, 
We have the Abraham story and on and on. Then we have the creation of the church in Acts 2. I think that's the right interpretation. But then the redemption point, the first thing is the rapture of the church. That's Thessalonians 4. The rapture happens. And that begins the final redemptive push for the church. We're resurrected. We've got our resurrected bodies. And then you have the restoration of Israel, the second coming, Amos 9, uh, Romans 11. A lot of passages we could talk about there. Um, and then we have the judgment of the nations, Isaiah 2, Matthew 25. I use the common term judgment, but that's, you know, there's going to be some people who pass that with flying colors. There's some good coming out of that, the establishment of the nations. Uh, in fact, Daniel 7 says people from every tribe, nation, and tongue, right? Okay. All going to be there. And then the final thing is redemption of creation. Romans 8 talks about that. Revelation 21 implies that. And there are other passages besides these that we could list up there. These are samples, but it illustrates God's work in history. Now, here's the point. When you look at this chart, you realize that God is busy. And God is doing a lot of things in history. God is a multi-track God. He can multitask. I cannot. My wife does it. Probably not as good as God, but close. <laughs> God has a multi-track thing going on in history. This is a philosophy of history. It's a dispensational philosophy of history. And that's different than the single track focus of individual redemption that dominates covenant theology. And you say, well, they talk about other things. Yeah, they do. Everybody's talking about the redemption of creation these days. Why? Because the environmental wackos are making us. Everybody's into creation care now. It kind of dominates the spirit of the age. So everybody's talking about it now, but not because of their theology because somebody's asked a question. Now, that's not so bad just by itself, but dispensationalists were talking about this back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Not something new on the radar. God has a plan for them. And Gabeline said this in an article in Our Hope magazine in 1905, and he says it again in 1938. Hasn't changed one whit in the way he presents this. It is a doxological focus. Now, Gabeline doesn't express it in those terms. He doesn't use the term that Ryrie uses in his third point. When Ryrie talked about the doxological unifying theme of the Bible, he's talking about the same thing here. That, you know, uh, the covenant guys were attacking dispensationalists. You guys, you chop up the Bible and all these dispensations. You have nothing to tie it together. And Ryrie, Ryrie basically told them, yeah, we do. We have the glory of God. Amen. I think that's enough. <laughs> and when you examine the text of the Bible, see, these are inductive things that come out of the text. They are not a system of theology that's been foisted upon the text. These are inductive observations. You just walk through the Bible, progressive revelation, you see the greatness of God as he does many Many things. This better gives God his due than that. Now, notice what Ryrie was not saying and Gabeline was not saying. Gabeline was not saying that covenant theologians don't believe in the glory of God. Westminster uh, Catechism. What's the first question? Any Presbyterians in here? What's the chief end of man? Presbyterian? Race Presbyterian. Okay. What is the chief end of man? And the answer is? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Of course they believe in the glory of God. That's not the point. Rari wasn't even addressing that. He was asking, in response to their accusation of us as not being able to pull everything together, and Rari was asking an entirely different question. He's asking which system better gives God his due. That's my 
drawn-out implication from Ryrie's, I think, well-crafted third point. It's all to the glory of God. Now, there is a, in, in Gabeline, there is a Christological focus for this. This is that lengthy quote I told you earlier today that I would show you. It's about four slides long. I want you to, can you focus for a little bit here? This is Gabeline. There is but one answer to all these questions concerning the promised hope for Israel, for the nations of the earth, and for all creation. That answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have no trouble agreeing with that. But he elaborates. He alone is the only answer, the completest answer, the never failing answer to all our questions. But what do we mean when we give his ever blessed and adorable name, the name above every other name, as the only answer? We do not mean that the answer is a practical application of the principles of righteousness declared by the infallible teacher in the Sermon on the Mount. We do not mean the practice of what has been termed the golden rule. We do not mean a leadership of Jesus. We do not mean that these questions will be answered by future spiritual revivals, nor do we mean that a blasted Western civilization misnamed Christian, he needs to tell us what he really thinks, (laughs) will influence heathen nations to accept Christianity and turn to God from their idols. The sorrowful fact is that what military Christendom has done and is doing and the shameful failures of Western civilization has been a curse to heathen nations. What we mean, the only answer, the completest and never failing answer to all our questions is the glorious reappearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. This future event will answer every question, solve every problem which humanity faces today and all the existing chaotic conditions and bring about that golden age of which heathen prophets dreamed, which the Bible promises is in store for the earth. Cable, I believe the second coming was the ultimate answer to our questions. And I think he coupled it with the first coming and what Christ did as the foundation. But Jesus is coming, as we often say, to make all things right. That's what he's talking about. And it's that prophetic hope. If you go back to my slide, let's see if I can do this. See, at the top of the pyramid, you know, swings over to second coming things. You know, the rapture and then the restoration of Israel at the end of the trib when Jesus comes back. And then you have the judgment of the nations, the redemption of the creation in the new heavens and new earth later on. It's the second coming that triggers all those things. The rapture and the second coming that triggers all those things. And he reminds us that we do indeed as people, no matter what happens in Washington or might I say here in this wonderful state in Austin, No matter what happens, we have a glorious future ahead of us. And it's because we have a great God who's doing many things all to his glory. Okay. I guess we have time. Do we have time for questions? Okay, it's time to play Stump Stallard. (laughs) Anybody have any questions? Anybody awake enough, alert enough to ask questions? So y'all ate too much cake and cookies and sugar. Anybody have any questions? Bruce? No? I thought he was perfectly clear. Okay, let, let me ask you a question in relation to the doxological purpose of the unifying theme of the Bible. In relation to the... Now, how would you state the covenant unifying theme of the Bible? Individual redemption through election. Okay. <clears throat> One of my favorite questions. Why do you have such a lack of discussion in Reformed theologies in relation to the fall of Satan and spiritual warfare 
and the relationship as um, uh, Elliot was talking about yesterday in terms of the relationship of human history to the fall of Satan and the angelic rebellion. Well, I don't know what was said yesterday because I wasn't here, but I would say, you know, he had 13 centuries of the domination of amillennialism or some such number of centuries, and, of course, they believe in the binding of Satan today. Satan is not a big player on their radar compared to, to us. Well, do you think that it might have something to do with the fact that if you narrow your unifying theme of the Bible to redemption, and redemption has nothing to do with the angels, that by virtue of your limited theme, you've excluded the whole issue of angelic rebellion from from ultimate significance in the overall narrative of the scripture. Well, you certainly would diminish it. They might say they don't, you know, it's just diminished, not eliminated. But, you know, they, well, I'm not they, saying they eliminate it. I mean, it just, yeah. it, with, with their, limited, their limited unifying purpose, it doesn't seem to play a role within... Not a major role. So it becomes yeah. virtually ignored or not yeah. that significant. They, they would look at my, blo- my eye of the Illuminati there, God's plan for angels, and say, yeah, I believe that, but it's not a big deal. Yeah, right, right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. We give a broader role... Because the doxological purpose is much broader, we bring that in. One of the things that struck me I'm, as I'm preparing for a series on dispensationalism following this conference here, <laughs> I've been reading the you know the introductions, first two or three chapters of probably 10 or 15 different books on dispensationalism. And one of the things that struck me was they all seem to start very close to the beginning with either the fall of Satan or the or Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen emphasizing the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture, and usually they if they don't start with one, they start with the other, and that that is significant in in you know everybody from Clarence Larkin to to uh, Darby to Ryrie to others. That's that's a major emphasis. Well, I, I ask the covenant guys a different question. I ask them why they don't talk about Israel. It's a good question too. But they do talk about Israel. They talk about boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Thank you for the uh, uh, discussion on the doxological purpose of history. I, I always enjoy hearing that just because even though I know it, it still warms my heart, so I appreciate that. Um, but I do wonder if that third point, while certainly important and true, is truly essential to dispensationalism. I realize that uh, we have something different than the individual redemption of the elect, but Jonathan Edwards focused heavily on a doxological purpose of history, and he was certainly not a dispensationalist. So it's certainly clear that you can hold that position while not being a dispensationalist, while the other two points of the sine qua non, I don't think you can hold and not be a dispensationalist. So is that really essential to dispensationalism? I think it is a logical consequence of the first of literal interpretation. And you have the distinction between us and the church. We'll see the distinction between us and the church is on this chart, but there's other distinctions besides Israel and the church. And so when you have a literal grammatical historical interpretation, you're going to take the Bible at face value and all these things are just laid out on the table as they are. And so I think logically the philosophy of history follows from literal interpretation. So I think it, it follows. Now, some guy may jump into it and not follow the wrong method. You know, that happens. I mean, I have in my life held to the right interpretation of a passage for the wrong reasons. Sometimes we do that. And maybe that's, I don't know uh, enough about Edwards to really say that. Tommy? And I bet you've held to the wrong interpretation for the right reasons. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if, if I had had more time, I might have talked about how in the 1700s, People like Jonathan Edwards were occupied with writing history of redemption essays. And they were starting to 
C, uh, to, there, which was a precursor to modern dispensationalism in the sense of discussing what God was doing in history with man, you know, from that perspective. And uh, Edwards, of course, wrote his famous essay on history of redemption, and that contributed, and many other Puritans did as well, contributed, I think, to the development of dispensationalism as they began to uh, write the charts and all of those kind of stuff with the ages. So I think the fact that he concludes the, the uh, purpose for the history of redemption is the glory of God, you see, is what dispensationalists also concluded when uh, they began to uh, periodize history, you know. Do you think, Tommy, that uh, a post mill would have a better chance of doing that than an on mill? Definitely, because yeah. it's, because they're still interested in the details of eschatology, which the right. on mills. I mean, they're they're certainly cousins, but they but they have more interest in details. Where the eschatology chart for on mill is real easy, you know. It's pure reductionism. It. Yeah, it is. It's re- it's a reductionist eschatology, but also the historicism contributes to that as well. Uh, you know, trying to figure out, you know, where we are in the book of Revelation, and, and Edwards was big on that. You know, Jonathan Edwards has all kinds of comparisons between what happened in the old world, Christ died in the old world, but in the new world, this is where the millennium was going to break out over here, because we're showing those folks back over in England how to do church. <laughs> Another question. I'm getting my exercise. This might not be fair, but what would a dispensational theology look like if this is under-accentuated or ignored altogether? It may be from experience or historical. Like when this is under-accentuated, what does dispensational theology look like? Well, I think the theology, you know, it would take a little while to flesh something like that out, but uh, I, th- I think you have, uh, you have a truth. I mean, certainly the first two points by themselves are truthful. I mean, I was a dispensationalist who held just the first two points for a couple decades. Okay? Uh, but I don't think my theological system was as robust. And I didn't have uh, some of the uh, good things, the depth, grounding with which I could respond uh, to other systems with. So I think it adds something in that respect. Thank you. Uh, when you listed uh, Gabeline's books from 33 to 38, do you know anything about how they were received? I mean, what was the extent of their coverage of the country? Uh, conf- they were received well in the Christian dispensational community. I mean, he was, he was one of our icons. I mean, there may have been a couple of detractors, but he was well-received. He was, his book, A Conflict of the Ages, was vilified by liberal Christians. It was viewed as just a, a, a kooky, spooky, out there, conspiracy, uh, conspiracy of history kind of guy. Um, so the, the liberal Christians really went after him for that particular book. I guess where I'm getting at, though, is if we consider it compared to Hal Lindsey, for example, his late great planet Earth, where we, you, know, you have any idea about the coverage of the country of the book? Or I don't think it would be as widespread as Hal Lindsey's. He's book. got what? Hal's got 35 million in print. I don't think we can compare anything to that except maybe the Left Behind series. <laughs> what? Yeah, the purpose-driven church. Yeah, I have five. I have five of my books in Siberia. But... <laughs> <laughs> in deep freeze. <laughs> All right. Well, Mike, we thank you very much for that. It was good historical Thanks. presentation. Appreciate it very much. <clears throat> okay, we will. Uh, just a reminder that to, um, that this afternoon, in about twenty-five minutes. Uh, Charlie Clough is going to present a. Uh, t- there's going to have a little talk discussion about the uh, link uh, between our bodies and our food. For those of you who might be feeling a little guilty already, and uh, yeah, yeah, run out, 
and and this will be the last chance you have to get a piece of chocolate cake or carrot cake without feeling guilty. <laughs> okay, and that will be in uh, approximately 30 minutes. So otherwise, we're taking a break now, and then we'll be coming back. I think that if people need rides to and from, uh, most people probably have already hooked up or connected in that way. Uh, so if, do they need to meet out here for a ride back to the hotel? Okay, back here in the in the um, uh, foyer at the entry if you need a ride or are going to provide a ride. Okay, we'll see you all back.